Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Time's flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. For example, just think for a moment about how you feel when you bite into a pear, wear a feather boa, stand in a noisy auditorium, or walk past a perfume counter in a crowded department store. Some people love the grainy texture of a pear, while others shudder just thinking about it. A feather boa could feel luxurious and sensual to one person, but deeply irritating to another. Likewise, there are people who love the energising buzz they get from strong scents and noisy environments. And there are others still who are completely overwhelmed by them. Life is full of sensations, and we all have our own sensory patterns that affect how we relate to everything that happens to us throughout the day. And though we rarely think about it, how we respond to everyday experiences like those I've just described can not only make or break our day, but also contribute to the success or failure of our relationships. My guest today is Dr. Winnie Dunn, Professor and Chair of the Department of Occupational Therapy Education at the University of Kansas, an internationally recognised expert on sensory processing knowledge. Her work, which has been a critical link in understanding the issues of children with attention deficits and autism, has helped countless parents put an end to conflicts, meltdowns and misunderstandings that threaten their family's harmony. And now she's written a book called Living Sensationally, Understanding Your Senses, that explains how understanding our own and others' sensory patterns can dramatically transform our relationships and our lives at home and at work. Dr. Winnie Dunn, welcome. Welcome. Hi, thanks for such a nice introduction. Winnie, when it comes to cracking the code of creating a satisfying life, I think few would argue that one of the most important skills is knowing how to build successful relationships. And in your book, Living Sensationally, you say that understanding our own and our loved one's senses is critical in that regard. Tell us why. Well, it's critical because um, it's another, it's a new way to interpret what behaviors mean. Um, in our relationships, if we think someone is disregarding us or ignoring us, we might have our feelings hurt. But if we understand that the person needs some time alone to kind of regather themselves, um, we um, understand them. We say, okay, go ahead and, and regather yourself and I'll see you in a few minutes. And it doesn't create a rift between the two people. Um, the different, uh, a, a seeker is one of the sensory patterns. They want to have more interactions and do more things together. And a person who's an avoider needs uh, to have some time alone to kind of regather themselves. And those misunderstandings can lead to lots of uh, conflict that isn't necessary. Well, I certainly had my eyes opened reading the book and really had to reassess my judgments of some of the people in my life. <laughs> I so, bet. It's quite sobering, but it's absolutely fascinating. Now, you have won pretty much every major award in your profession. You've presented hundreds of workshops and seminars, professional papers internationally, and you're responsible for all the most prominent sensory profile measures used in both professional practice and in research programs. And yet you've written this wonderful book for the lay person. <laughs> what made you decide to do this? Well, you know, I'm so glad you asked me that because that, that I had a really important reason. Um, uh, there was um, activity going on probably 10 or 15 years ago where it seemed like professionals were finding more and more ways to um, segregate 
people that were different, you know, finding diagnoses and behavior patterns. And they just kept, it seemed like everyone was adding more and more diagnoses onto people, especially children, and um, characterizing them as somebody that should be set apart from everyone else. And I, I have really strong feelings about um, all the people in the world um, being exactly the way they're supposed to be. And I thought, you know, how can I take the research I've done and make a small contribution to people feeling more alike than different? And so I set about to use the research I'd already done with children and adults, but then I also interviewed um, friends and people I met in the airports about their, their lived experiences with their sensory events in everyday life. And um, I decided that I needed to write this book for the public so that when people read it, even people, even like parents that have a child with Asperger's syndrome or that have a child with ADHD, they would look at the book and say, you know what, this story is just like my son or this story is just like my husband. And it would make them feel like the things that are going on were more regular than irregular. I wanted people to feel included as members of humanity rather than segregated because of a particular characteristic that might be just quirky. Why did you first get attracted to occupational therapy? I mean, if this information is new, it wasn't this that attracted you. (laughs) That's true. Um, You know, I I kind of fell upon it, but I have learned in my life that sometimes you you don't really fall upon things. You're like paying attention to the things that matter to you. Mm -hmm. Um, This this idea about how people live their life has always been really fascinating to me. And um, and actually an occupational therapy program was starting at the university I was at. And uh, there were some women uh, older than me in the dormitory I lived in, and they kept telling me, by watching the things I did every day, you need to be an occupational therapist. (laughs) So um, I guess I I need to find those women and thank them for uh, pointing me in a direction. They saw something in me that was, um, that I valued people's everyday experiences, which is the core thing that occupational therapists do. We look at everyone's routines and their everyday life activities and ask how we can make them more satisfying for people. So they they really pointed me in that direction, and uh, I've I've been I, I just I can't imagine I've been so satisfied in this profession for all these decades. I I feel very fortunate that that's been my experience. Well, one of the things that struck me about this book is, you know, I've spent most of my adult life studying psychology. You know, I'm fascinated like you, you know, how people think, why they do the things they do. Yeah. And for me, your book was such a, a missing piece of the puzzle. Um, huh. You know, it should be up there with John Gray's, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and <laughs> how to win friends and influence people because yes. it just that makes so much sense. Oh, that was a pun you made. <laughs> so it was, <laughs> unintentionally. <laughs> I think that, you know, I just think that um, the sensory experiences we have in everyday life are so much part of who we are that we really sort of, we don't even think about them sometimes. You know, we don't, and, and I think what happened when I wrote Living Sensationally is it made people pay attention to those things that automatically happen in everyday experiences and it made them think, you know, why am I doing this? And why does my husband do this other thing? And why does my daughter do this other thing? People I think became more aware of the differences in the behavior being because of the sensory experience. I don't think that connection had been made before. Uh, It's always been there. It makes so much sense to people. It helps us with our relationships with others. I mean, you know, I found myself um, understanding all my relatives so much better. (laughs) You're like, okay, you can sit at the other table. (laughs) (laughs) I I think that is what what is so nice about the the sensory experience. And the other part that I think is really important is um, when you understand that difference, that has this sort of um, clear meaning, then uh, you also have ideas about how to manage it. 
you know, for families with children, you know, if a child needs a lot of jumping, you know, understanding that helps you plan the day so that you get more movement and jumping in. Or if a child needs more quiet, it makes you be more careful about how you plan the series of activities um, that a family might engage in. Yeah, one of the pieces that really struck me was, you know, uh, the relationship arena, because I think that is so important. Couples um, who have different sensory styles and oh, man. the ways that they can learn to manage that. Yes, I agree completely. I think that, um, you know, the, the issues around uh, touching each other and what kind of touch is acceptable and not acceptable, mm-hmm. uh, whether you want to talk right away when you get home or be quiet, all those things, um, you know, if, we, if we, we're so vulnerable in our primary relationships and we need to understand those behaviors about each other so that we honor who the other person is rather than try to get them to not be like that anymore. Absolutely. I mean, you know, also the arguments that one can forestall. I can look back on some of my relationships and say, if only I'd had this book then. Yes, you can say, okay, okay, I understand what's going on here. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really funny um, how it, we, we make jokes about it in our family. You know, we say, well, yeah, it's because you're a bystander or that's because you're a seeker. And everybody can kind of laugh about it instead of thinking, you know, how irritating that person is all the time. Or how criticized they are all the time. Yeah, Yeah. for for being themselves. I mean, that's what the bottom line here is, is that when you you are in your natural state from a sensory point of view, um, you know, that's what you want everyone to honor about you. Absolutely. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. And my guest is Dr. Winnie Dunn, who's the leading authority on how we respond to sensory experiences in our everyday lives. After the break, we'll find out more about the four sensory types and how each style might prefer to organize their life. We'll be back in a few moments. Don't go away. You're listening to OTR-FM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Being a radio host on IOM-FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single OM Times endeavor. Host your show with OM Times Radio Network. Hi everyone, this is Shea Parker, the host of Best of the Best, which airs live right here on IOM Radio every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific. I'm super excited to bring you expert guest hosts, spiritual discussions, free psychic readings, and so much more. I can promise that you will not want to miss this one-of-a-kind, fun, yet touching, down-to-earth show. Join us every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Pacific on OTRFM. This is Shay Parker, and I can't wait to see you there. Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Elia, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Have you ever wondered how to change your love paradigm? The secret key is finding a love partnership, not just a regular connection. How do you find these? Through conscious relationships. Ascending Hearts Dating is a dating site for people like you that believes in second chances and a different type of spiritual connection. Try Ascending Hearts for free today at AscendingHearts.com and change your love paradigm. Ascending Hearts, the premier dating community for the spiritually awake. You're listening to OTR-FM, part of the IOM Radio Network. What is going on? I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and my guest is Winnie Dunn, Professor and Chair of the Department of Occupational Therapy Education at the University of Kansas Medical Center and author of Living Sensationally, Understanding Your Senses. 
Winnie, tell us about the four major sensory types. So um, in the research I did, I, um, we've tested babies and children and adolescents and adults and older adults. Um, so we found these um, these patterns uh, in the responses that people have, and they organize around um, four basic types. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, one of the types is called seekers, and uh, the seekers really love sensation, and they um, – their brains are wired to um, notice new stimuli and they want to get more all the time. They, they just want to, so these are the people that, um, you know, skip instead of walk or wear um, heavy jewelry that, that's noisy during the day or um, that want to try adventurous kinds of activities because their brain is geared to want to have novel experiences over and over. A seeker is likely to, drive different ways to work, for example, because they want to see, you know, if they can go a different way and still, you know, have an experience of getting there at the same time. And uh, so their brain is always looking for new sensory experiences. Uh, The second category are called avoiders. So um, people that are avoiders, um, they want very little stimuli. Uh, Their brains are geared to detect very, very tiny um, sensory stimuli, and so um, their brains can get overwhelmed really quickly. New input is seen as potentially harmful, so um, avoiders like to have lots of routines. They like to have things um, be the same over and over. They might uh, eat the same meals every week. Uh, They might go to the same places. They might have um, a clothing pattern that they keep all the time because um, it keeps them from having to experience a lot of new or unexpected sensations throughout the day. Avoiders might pull down the shades and just minimize the amount of um, ambient experiences that they have. Uh, The third category are called sensors. They also have really low sensory thresholds. Their, their, uh, their brains detect lots of details, but um, the avoiders are more likely to sort of go away and be alone. And sensors uh, want to participate, but they get overwhelmed. So um, they might be more bossy, you know, asking you to tone it down or, um, you know, not use such bright colors. They want to have more soft palettes in their, in their homes and in their clothing choices. Um, sensors are more likely to have um, favorite meals at, at restaurants and go uh, like before the rush so that they can have a more quiet and uh, dedicated type of meal. Uh, sensors are very loyal to brands. They find socks or pants that they really like and they buy all the ones they can buy because they want to make sure they still have them if they um, quit making them because they like how they feel on their body. Um, the, the fourth category are uh, called bystanders. And bystanders, um, their brains are geared with very high um, sensory thresholds. So they, they, um, don't, they miss stuff. They, they fail to detect something that's going on around them. They might seem um, like an airhead or might seem ditzy or oblivious. Those are kind of the words you might use about a person like that. But they're also very easygoing because the fact that they don't notice as many things means they kind of go with the flow on everything. Um, things don't upset them very quickly. But they also might not notice something that is important um, to pick up on. And so like in a parenting situation, a bystander parent might miss some of the cues from their children about what's going on that they need to pay attention to. It's really important to know that they are these four patterns are just characteristics of who people are. They're not diagnoses that need to be um, marked down and fixed. Um, Seekers are always going to be seekers and avoiders are always going to be avoiders. The deal is that if you understand how the sensory pattern works, you can organize your life and your activities and your schedule to be in sync with your sensory patterns instead of fighting against them. For example, an avoider might prefer to telecommute, which these days is an easier thing to do. Uh, They wouldn't have to be in the hustle bustle of the office. Conversely, the seekers want to be at the office around the other people where they can encounter new things and come up with new ideas all the time. 
So understanding your pattern makes it easier to create a routine without feeling apologetic about it, um, that it matches how you like to take in information. And when you feel more like yourself, you're a better person to be around for everyone else as well. So could you be, uh, you know, do you have like a primary and a secondary preference? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that. You know, the thing that's really interesting from the research is that um, if, rather than it being like primary and secondary, it's really related to the context you're in. So like if, um, uh, if a person is in a really quiet environment, it might not bring out some of these other characteristics than when they're in a busy environment. You know, an avoider is going to f- seem very peaceful in um, a church situation or in a very formal uh, presentation where everybody's sitting quietly and, and being very um, attentive. But that same person is going to look very different at a concert where lots of unexpected things are happening. So rather than it being primary and secondary, it's really related to the place you're in and the activities you're trying to do. So uh, one of the things I always think about is like going to a concert is a good example. You know, everybody can go to a concert, but they're going to go to the concert a different way. You know, if you're a seeker, you're going to go out ahead of time and and talk about the concert and you're going to be down on the floor where everybody's bumping into each other and dancing during the concert and you're going to go out after the concert. An avoider is probably going to get their tickets ahead of time, probably try to sit on the railing so people can't bump into them, you know, up off the floor so that they'll be separated from other people. They might leave early or wait till later to leave. So, so people have different ways of experiencing the same thing even uh, to accommodate their own sensory needs. So might you also, um, you know, be a seeker? when it comes to your visual sense, but not right. when it comes to scent? That is a very, that's a very good point. Um, you know, some people are very sensitive to the visual environment, but they might be a seeker for um, colognes and perfumes and the sense of the foods they eat. They might be smelling everything and trying out everything, but they don't, but they want to have a very calm visual environment. Uh, that's part of how we're wired too. And that's what, you know, if you think about settings, Um, different sensory experiences come up during different activities and settings. You know, you're going to have more aromas during a meal that you're eating with someone uh, than when you're in other kinds of settings. And that might change the the, the, um, texture of how you can behave during that particular experience. (coughs) It's fascinating. I mean, you know, I think about my grandson who is, um, has been diagnosed with sensory processing disorder he is Asperger's and I've seen many of the things that you talk about you know he socks labels um likes heavy (laughs) heavy clothing all of those things and then sometimes he does something that completely throws me and I think well I wouldn't have figured that one um so what you just said explains it yeah yeah it's it's so interesting you know I've had mothers say to me she keeps telling me there's knots in the socks and I can't find any. And it's like, well, you know, you might have to find a microscope, but if somebody's very, very sensitive to the texture of, um, of a, a fiber, they're going to detect a tiny little, a tiny little knot that's inside the fibers that you or I would never notice or the, the socks being twisted, you know, and, and um, the unfortunate thing is when kids, like your grandson, don't have people around them that understand. It looks like they're being irrational. You know, that's when we say things like meltdowns. Um, But but a meltdown is a a way to try to communicate to people. You know, this isn't working for me. I need some help and I don't know what to do. Um, You know, so like he might pull his socks off and his parents are like, oh my gosh, we got to get to school. And, um, you know, without thinking about the fact that there's something about the socks that are, he's trying to communicate, there's something about these socks that I can't handle. So um, he's very lucky to have people around that at least pause and think about that. Well, I think, you know, one of the hard things is, it's all about me, isn't it? I mean, everything in life is all about me. (laughs) And so we tend to always look for the reason why somebody's doing it to get at us. (laughs) Um, Yes. 
you know, that person is making a lot of noise because they want to irritate me. <laughs> yes. And, you know, I, I think about that a lot. And I, I'm like, you know, th- this child has many other things to do than than irritate you. You know, they're they're trying to tell you something. You know, are you paying attention to what that is that they're trying to tell you? And we try to get kids, especially on our timeline, when our timeline might not be working for the, the needs that that particular child has at that moment. It's hard. It's, really hard. It's very hard. I mean, for a parent who might be, I don't know, an, uh, an avoider. <laughs> um, oh, my goodness. You know, how do they deal with it? It's, it is hard, you know. But, like, I've worked with some families where, um, you know, I, we, I just give them, sometimes just giving people the words helps. You know, if the mom can say, you know, her son, the, in this one case, the, the son thought the mom was just mad at him all the time. And they, they learned through the, our process of conversation to say, you know, uh, Tom, you know, I know you need to jump and I support you to jump, but you've got to do it downstairs because it's too hard for me to take. Yeah. So that it isn't about I don't like you. It's like I know what you need and I know what I need. Let's find a place where we can both be happy doing those things. I bet when you speak to parents and explain these things to them, it really must just be the most amazing shift in perception for them. Well, it just it's, it, it, it makes them be able to take a breath and, and you know, it helps them feel more competent yes. to be able to detect those behaviors and derive some meaning from them rather than just feeling overwhelmed and frustrated all the time. I'm sure it must be so difficult. Well, I know it was very difficult for my daughter with my grandson until she under, began to understand. And your book right. has helped tremendously <laughs> because she also... Well, and, and as, as he gets older, he can read it and yes. understand it better too. Yeah, understand about them. I mean, one of the points you make is, you know, we mustn't forget that every one of these patterns, there's a gift. Yes. Yes. <laughs> we'll talk more about that after. Let's do that. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer and my guest is Dr. Winnie Dunn and we're talking about living sensationally by understanding your senses. We'll be back in a few moments. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of OM Times Media one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Ohm Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Matt Connerton here. Join Jen Coffee and I twice a week for Matt Connerton Unleashed, a political talk show that's a little different than what you're used to. No liberal or conservative agenda here, just an honest dialogue about truth and how things really work in the world of politics. Matt Connerton Unleashed, every Tuesday and Thursday night at 11 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul. Every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. As difficult as it is to believe, There are places in Africa where human traffickers sell albino children and their body parts for use in magic rituals. Humanity Healing International is actively working in Uganda to change this paradigm. The Albino Rescue Project finds albino children who are at risk and places them in safe schools and environments where they can learn and grow free from fear. To learn more or to sponsor a child, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. This is OTRFM. Part of the IOM Radio Network. In making and breaking our relationships. <laughs> Winnie, how can we discover our own pattern and those of our friends and our kids and our partners? 
Well, uh, there's lots of things you can watch. Um, in Living Sensationally, there's a little checklist that can give you some clues about what things you tend to do. And uh, there's a lot of um, tables and worksheets in there so that you can um, – I write things about what you're likely to do during everyday life, during work, during, as you said earlier, relationships. So there's lots of um, – um, little checklist that people can look at and a lot of stories. You know, th- the main thing is um, being willing to have a conversation about it. Why, why do you need to do that? Why is it that you're doing that? What, what is, how does that help you? Um, or I, I noticed that you do X, you know, I, you know, just, I think the idea of just being regarded matters a lot instead of being disregarded. And your sensory patterns are so much, at the core of who you are, that when they're disregarded, um, hurt feelings can happen a lot. Um, you know, you said before the break to talk about what the gifts are. Um, each of these patterns has really lovely contributions to make. And like when I'm in my work setting, I try to make sure I have people from all these different patterns because they contribute different things to um, the good work that we're able to do together. So, like I said earlier, bystanders are really easygoing. So they're they're people that can bring others together. They kind of go with the flow. They don't get bothered by things that are going on. They can really concentrate because they're not distracted like some of the other patterns are. And um, so they're they're easy people to be around. But that creates a gathering place for others. Um, sensors are are very detail-oriented. They notice a lot of things. In fact, there's a lot of people that are artists um, that fall into the sensor category. And I think think why that happens is, you know, they see things about the world the rest of of us miss. And when we see their art, we appreciate that they noticed that thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we appreciate they noticed the purple in something or that they noticed the texture of something. Uh, But we might not have noticed it without their help. Um, so sensors give us um, that, that rich gift. Um, avoiders give us the gift of understanding how to create really, really effective routines because their, their brains are so geared to um, creating sameness and similarity and familiarity all the time. They have really good skills at coming up with organizational structures and systems and routines at work and at home that are um, predictable. And that is really helpful to lots of, lots of places where you and I spend our time. And then seekers are always the people that we can count on for being um, uh, the ones that come up with new ideas because they're geared to detect novelty. So every time there's something, a new aspect of a project, the seekers are the ones that are going to be able to point it out really quickly. Yeah, you know, I realized my daughter-in-law is the perfect seeker. Um, is she? Yeah, she, she checks every single box. Um, you know, <laughs> she, she's, and she's brilliant at what she does. But she's always telling me to become a runner like her. She loves oh, running. Oh, boy. And that is not my thing at all. <laughs> no, me either. So, yeah, so that's really interesting because now I don't need to feel guilty about not being a runner. <laughs> Right, but but you also can appreciate that she needs yes. to do that. Her her body and her brain need that additional input that running provides. That's what I love about this. I mean, a really smart leader, you know, in in a in an office or you know, a corporation would pick his team based on this. Oh, I absolutely, I absolutely think that's a really important aspect. We pick by like you said earlier, psychology and and some of those other characteristics. But this is a really primal feature of people. Um, It's it's just so much part of their humanity that people forget about it. And, um, you know, like I have somebody in my office that doesn't turn the lights on in his office. He only has the ambient light that comes from his computer screen because his, his... his need for visual input is so, you know, low. He he needs to have a very, like, calm and zen-like visual environment for himself. And um, it's it's like he's the only one that doesn't turn his lights on. So we only know he's there because the door might be ajar, uh, but it's always dark. And uh, he has that. He he has figured out that that is the amount 
on a visual input that allows him to still focus his attention on his work. And I, I just think that's so great. Do you get many companies coming to you to ask about this? Because, you know, nowadays companies are investigating all sorts of ways to, to create cohesion amongst their teams and get everybody working to their strengths. This, this seems like a natural. Yeah, you know, in fact, there is an OT in South Africa that um, she worked with the call centers that are in South Africa because they, they suffer from the, the dilemma of having lots of turnover. And so um, she made a pitch to them that part of the turnover was because they weren't creating work environments and uh, the pods and things where people worked. They weren't creating work environments that were a good match for people from a sensory point of view. And so they, uh, because it was a bad match, they would easily leave quickly. And so they reorganized how they did some of their work so that people that were um, – you know, less distracted because they were bystanders could be in the more busy aspects of the business because people talking next to them wouldn't be so bothersome because bystanders can really focus. And then giving uh, different kinds of jobs to people that had lower sensory thresholds uh, like sensors and avoiders so that they wouldn't get so um, overtaken by the, the busy uh, call center that they would end up quitting. So they kind of did a filtering system and uh, matched the job to the person based on the sensory patterns. And that it was a really effective method. What dictates our sensory pattern? Is it hereditary? Is it something that develops uh, you know, nature I, I nurture? Think, yeah, I think that, I think we are sort of born with a pattern, you know, um, but, but that being said, just like everything, that the arguments between genetics and, and heredity and environment, um, you know, if you're, in a, if you're, if you're a um, person that's born with a seeking pattern and you were born into a, a very sort of formal, um, stately kind of family, um, you, might, you might have a harder time navigating because you look like the weirdo all the time. <laughs> than if you were born into kind of a bustly family. You know, I think part of this is related to um, how you come to understand these things about yourself. A kid that's in a more formal family might not, might not have the opportunities to explore and sort of be themselves um, from a sensory point of view. Uh, I, I think we all can say things like, you know, that kid is, has the right mom, or that kid has the right dad, or if that child had a different father, then you know this would be easier for him. Um, and I think some of that is related to this uh, sensory patterns and how families are able to honor the sensory patterns of the parents as well as the sensory patterns of the children as they plan activities um, at home and in the community. So if we all have sensory patterns, what is it that makes the difference between being normal if there's such a thing and kids that are or people that are diagnosed with sensory processing disorder well i um you know i'm i'm sort of not on the big trail of of calling people disordered because their sensory patterns are different from other people i think that the issue for me is is the adaptability like the 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 children and families that i uh serve are those that can't figure it out without some support, you know, without some coaching. Um, so to me, it's more about um, what support do you need to figure it out rather than do you have a disorder or not? Um, I, I think that it's about understanding um, how to figure it out with a professional and with your family members rather than saying this person has a disorder and this person doesn't. It, because the truth is, you know, if you look at the data, there are people in the normal, quote-unquote normal, population that have differences in sensory processing that are probably the same patterns as your grandson. Yes. yes but they indeed. have figured out ways to manage that in their everyday life. And so they don't come to the surface as having, quote-unquote, a disorder. 
you know, and so one of those studies we're working on right now is asking children that have those patterns that would match your grandson, but that are in the general population, asking them what their strategies are, you know, like, yeah, you're, you really hate all that loud noise. So what do you do at school when people are making a lot of noise? What are your strategies? And the kids tell us all kinds of really interesting <laughs> things that they do. You know, I say I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> it is you fascinating. You know, well, that's a way to get away from it. Yeah, how it's, creative they can be. I think so. But they don't know they're being creative. And so, you know, we get a chance by understanding sensory patterns, we get a chance to inform them about why that's a good strategy. And then they come up with more. Yeah. Yeah, I know my grandson has developed some really interesting strategies and, and I'm, you know, I'm just baffled at how he came up with them, but they work for him. They're brilliant. I know. Aren't they just amazing? They are. How do you feel about, I mean, you said that you're not a great fan of these labels and, mm-hmm. but, and yet your name is on all of those uh, sensory profile assessment forms and some people and I know it certainly happens in England, they tend to, you know, put the kid in a box and that's it. Yeah, they they do. And that's an irony of, of uh, academic life is um, the girl who made this test that they use to say somebody has a sensory processing disorder says don't call people that. So. You know, but once knowledge is out there, people get to use it however they wish. They do. And, and part of why I wrote Sensor, Living Sensationally was to try to work a, work a different direction. Like, look, all the people do these things. You yeah. know, everyone does some of these things. Our job is to help people have a satisfying life and, and navigate with the patterns that they have, not to say that they're, they have to be set aside or marked as different from everyone else. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and my guest is Professor Winnie Dunn, author of Living Sensationally, Understanding Your Senses. After the break, Winnie will offer some strategies to help you live a more satisfying life. We'll be back in a few moments. You're listening to OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. This is Terry Van Horn, and I want to invite you to join me for my weekly radio show, Healing Light, on Ohm Times Radio, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On Healing Light... We want to bring love, light, and blessings into your world. You can find out more about us at www.healinglightonline.com. Blessings. Hello, I'm Miriam Knight of New Consciousness Review, inviting you to my new show where I interview the rising stars of the Conscious Awakening. We'll explore the many faces of consciousness and action and intriguing perspectives on life, the universe, and everything in between. Join us each Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern on The Rising Stars Show. As difficult as it is to believe, there are places in Africa where human traffickers sell albino children and their body parts for use in magic rituals. Humanity Healing International is actively working in Uganda to change this paradigm. The Albino Rescue Project finds albino children who are at risk and places them in safe schools and environments where they can learn and grow free from fear. To learn more or to sponsor a child, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. This is OTRFM. 
part of the IOM Radio Network. Welcome back to What is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'm speaking with Professor Winnie Dunn, author of Living Sensationally, Understanding Your Senses. Winnie, your book is so rich with information. There are so many strategies, uh, so many ideas and tips in there. We can't possibly cover them all. But, um, <laughs> you know, let's have a little chat about relationships because, you know, none of us, we, we can't live without our relationships. And yes. particularly the loved ones, which are, you know, they contribute greatly to our satisfaction in life. I mentioned earlier about one of the stories in your book about the couple and the waking up in the morning and they both have different <laughs> styles. And you came up with some great strategies there. Can you give us some ideas and uh, tell us about situations like that? that yeah, well, that story was is about a couple where um, I don't remember if the man or the woman, one of them um, gets up early and... Uh, it's very um, happy to be awake and very busy in the morning, and it's very annoying to the other partner. And um, because uh, the the amount of activity is so uh, disruptive to the per- other person being able to sleep, um, it's funny because that is actually the opposite story that I have with my husband. My husband is a bystander, and if I'm out of town where I'm not clunking around and getting my clothes out and turning the lights on and off and opening and closing the doors, uh, which I think for most people hearing that would make them be like, Oh my God, that would be so terrible. <laughs> um, he doesn't wake up. He <laughs> needs all of that input. Cause he, you know, his sensory thresholds are so high. He needs all of that input to sort of gather up and get himself awake. And when I'm out of town, he has a hard time um, getting up in the morning because he doesn't have all those disruptive things to w- sort of wake him up. But if he was a sensor, that would be that would make his day start very badly because um, all that would just accumulate in his mind and and just make him feel irritable and overwhelmed before even getting out of bed. So how do you how do you resolve a situation like that apart from saying you know have separate rooms? <laughs> Well, the um, I mean, some people actually do have separate rooms because of it, but you can also um, put the, the, if the person that's staying in bed is the one that has the lower sensory thresholds, you can, uh, the other person can put all their morning routine things in another place, you know, instead of sort of the traditional idea is to put all of your things in your bedroom, but you can put your morning um, things for the bathroom and your underwear and your clothes, you can put those in another location so that the bedroom is really just for sleeping. And then once you get up and move out of the room, you're not coming back in there. So there's no light, there's no sound from the doors. Um, in this couple in the story, we um, we got a door that automatically closed because uh, he couldn't remember to get the door closed. So the light was piercing through the lock through the, um, the door jam. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so you, you just, once you understand what the other person's needs are, then you can sort of navigate a little bit more uh, carefully. I had a mom that she had two little boys and um, uh, one little boy was uh, a very, very active seeker type that needed lots of movement and uh, jumping and those sort of things. And, um, she was she had very low sensory thresholds herself and they we talked a lot about what activities do the two of you need to do separately and what activities do the, do you need to do together and so we came up with ideas for example um <clears throat> they would go to the park so he, he could play and he had the sense that she was there with him but she could sit on the park bench and uh, read her book you know read her kindle um and still be there with him, but not be in the intense closeness of uh, that kind of activity that was really so overwhelming for her that she was, you know, being um, kind of irritable with her son. Um, They came up with ideas of what they would say to each other to make sure that they understood that what the other, you know, mom, I know you need quiet, but I feel like playing, 
you know, we came up with phrases that they could use. Um, Sometimes having just a space in the house where it's a safe place for someone to go if they need to get away is a really helpful strategy so that it can just be kind of quiet and dark for a few minutes. It's helpful. Um, I'm a seeker, so like on my desk, I have um, over the years accumulated really lovely uh, quotes from people, and I just keep them randomly in folders and all around my desk so that when I'm reaching for something, I'll come upon it. And that sort of feeds my brain's need for novelty. You know, I'll come upon a little quote that's in a folder of a project I'm working on or I'll tape it up to the to the uh, computer so I see it in the morning and then I can move it off the computer. Um, but just those actions of novelty uh, keep my brain engaged because the the challenge for seekers is because our brains are geared to detect novelty. If we engage in the same routines over and over, our brains get distracted and drift looking for something new. So we have to sort of create novelty in our routines and settings so that we stay we stay focused on what's going on around us, like the work that we're trying to get done. What would, um, what would you suggest? I mean, you know, you can, one can rearrange one's home and do whatever right. one can in one's own environment. But what if you went on vacation together, but you're completely different types? How could you manage things then in a situation where you're not in control of the environment necessarily? Right. So, so at that point, you have to you have to control the parts you can, the schedule, you know, like... Um, being willing to have different activities. You know, I'm going to go to the library this morning and see what books they have. You go do your bungee jumping and we'll meet together for lunch um, is a good idea. I had a grandpa call me um, because he was, he said, I feel like I'm crabby grandpa. He was um, feeling really distressed because he got so quickly overwhelmed with his very active uh, grandchildren, of course. He said, I want to spend time with them, but I, I just get so bowled over by all the noise and activity. And so we talked through like what uh, what kinds of things their family liked to do and what their interests were. And uh, we came on a, what ended up being a really helpful strategy. He would take the, um, he would take either uh, the grandma or the uh, his daughter, who was the mother, some other one other adult, and they they would go to the movies together, and the grandpa would drive, and he would <clears throat> drop them all off at the door so they could all bustle in and get the tickets and you know be all swarmy with each other <laughs> running around to get to the theater. He would go park the car. Um, they would get their snacks and their drinks and get all settled in and save a place for grandpa. So. The kids all perceived, and he perceived that they were spending time together, but the, the grandpa didn't have to deal with all the bustly behavior. So he would like sneak into the dark theater and sit down with them, and they were all so happy for him to be there. But he didn't have to, he wasn't already overwhelmed from all the activity to get into the theater because he was the driver that was picking them up and dropping them off. So that was a strategy that really worked well for their family. How could knowing our own sensory pattern at work help us succeed? Um, in the workplace? In the workplace, um, yeah. I, yeah, I think that, I think that what, it, what it helps you do is um, divide up the work based on the, the natural state of each person instead of dividing up the work where each person has to do 25% of all the activities. You know, give the seeker the jobs um, of creating new ideas and coming up with new um, methods and strategies and give the avoider the jobs that require creating the schedule and making organizational structure and the file structure that we're going to use. Um, you know, uh, give the bystander the jobs of running um, errands, uh, to, you know, to keep them alert and uh, give the sensors the jobs of editing and the detail work and the precision because those are the things that each of those categories are good at. And it makes your work product even better. You know, it raises some interesting um, 
ideas for what could be done in classrooms as well with children. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, yeah, if, we're too regimented in classrooms. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know some classrooms are beginning to allow children like my grandson, you know, sit on, um, you know, the, the balls, the um, uh, right. yoga balls, etc. That those kinds of balls so that if they feel the need to keep moving, they can move and they're not disrupting the rest of the class. But yeah, and those life... have been really helpful for some children. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really helpful. Really would make life so much different for these children if we could help them. And ourselves, and ourselves. Yeah. Do you um? Do you ever get asked by uh, relationship counsellors to give them some uh, tips? Yeah. Yes. In fact, you know the thing that's so great about the relationship part is, um, it really helps. It, it really helps people to settle down all of their angst about the other person. You know. Um, It gives you a concrete thing you can do. You know, you might not be able to, like, deal with their psyche or whatever, but you can turn the radio down or you can use earphones so the other person doesn't hear the noise. You know, those are concrete sensory things you can do. You can change the kind of dishes you use in the kitchen so they're not so noisy. Um, You know, you can change the decorations in the home. Those are things that look like gifts of love when you understand what the other person needs it for. Winnie, I am going to have to leave it there, sadly. The book is a fabulous book. It's one of my favorites. I encourage everybody to read it. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. This is so fun. It is. Living Sensationally, Understanding Your Senses by Winnie Dunn is published by Jessica Kingsley and available on Amazon.com. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. Thanks for joining me today. And I look forward to being with you at the same time next week. Till then, it's goodbye from me.